life, I'm Erwin Shapiro. But today, I'm masquerading as Avi Love. <laughs> Anyone who notices any resemblance, I assure them it's purely coincidental. <laughs> today, we have, as usual, four speakers whose names and titles of their thoughts I will try to pronounce correctly, especially with their names. The first is Antonia Akwapchich from the ITC, as you can read, and the title of the talk is Spectral Signatures of Brahman Scattering in Exoplanet Atmospheres with Dorsal Primitive. The second speaker today will be Dominic Reaper Creatures from Cornell, who will talk on the tomography of cosmic reionization from C2 intensity mapping at redshifts 3.5 to 9 with CCAT Prime, a very precise and concise title. <laughs> the next speaker will be Eric Cobble, Cock, Cobble, from UC Berkeley, I hope I got that right. We'll talk on the general relativistic simulations of disformation and tidal disruption events. And fourth and last, but not least, Vicente, who is going to discuss Vicente Rodriguez Gomez from Johns Hopkins will talk about the role of mergers and halo spin in shaping the galaxy. And now, without further ado, Antonia will start first of all. Thank you. Each talk should be 10 minutes, and I will set this time up for 10 minutes and then five minutes, up to five minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, my work on the spectral signatures of Raman scattering and how we can use them to probe the uh, atmospheres of exoplanets. So by analyzing spectra of exoplanets, we can learn about their chemical composition and also about the physical properties of their atmosphere, so things like temperature, pressure, and so on. But this can be very difficult. So even if for a moment we ignore all the challenges associated with actually getting the data, Interpreting them can be difficult as well. And this is uh, because there are many degeneracies involved in the spectra. So these two plots um, demonstrate just two examples. So this uh, top figure uh, shows that uh, in an atmosphere with heavy molecules, so molecules like water and CO2, uh, these molecules suppress the formation of these prominent spectral features, and the resulting uh, transmission spectrum looks relatively flat. However, a flat transmission spectrum can also be caused by the presence of clouds. So how do we tell these two cases apart? The second figure shows, uh, demonstrates the difficulties associated with the presence of spectrally inactive uh, species. So these are molecules like molecular hydrogen or nitrogen, which can be very abundant in some atmospheres, but uh, because they're these homoatomic uh, molecules that don't have permanent dipole moments, they don't have prominent spectral signatures in this uh, wavelength range, so they don't show up in the spectra. So how do we know that they're there, and how do, can we measure their abundances? Uh, so because of these and some other uh, challenges uh, involved, it is always useful to have multiple and mutually complementary probes of various atmospheric uh, parameters. Uh, so, in the hope, so that we can hope to lift some of these degeneracies and provide more reliable constraints on the properties of atmospheres. So, in my talk, I will propose one such alternative method that we can use, um, and this is uh, based on looking the, for the spectral signatures of Raman scattering in exoplanet atmospheres. So, in the rest of my talk, I will tell you what Raman scattering is and how it introduces spectral features, um, and that these features contain information about the atmospheric composition, temperature, and atmospheric depth. And so these spectral features are contained in the reflected light from planets. So in the rest of my talk, I will be talking about albedo spectra. So for those of you who don't think in terms of albedo in your everyday life, you can just think of it, for the sake of this talk, as a measure of the reflected, ref, reflective properties of the uh, planet. So basically, it's the uh, light that is reflected from the planet uh, relative to the incident light coming from the star as a function of wavelength. Okay, so what is Raman scattering? Uh, Raman scattering, you can think of it as an inelastic version of Rayleigh scattering. So uh, in a Rayleigh scattering on a molecule, a molecule is excited by the incident photon, and then when it de-excites back, it goes to the original state that it came from. So the 
wavelength or the frequency of the scattered photon is the same as the frequency of the incident photon. In Raman scattering, on the other hand, the molecule doesn't go back to the same state, but it goes back either to a higher or a lower state than it originated from. And this difference in energy is picked up by the scattered photon. So the scattered photon is either red-shifted or blue-shifted with respect to the incident photon. Uh, and we call this uh, frequency offset Raman shift. And it is determined by the energy separation of molecular levels. So if we have some way to measure this offset that photons experience, we can say which molecule was involved in scattering. Uh, because the underlying physics of Raman and Rayleigh scattering is similar, they both have this lambda to the minus fourth power wavelength dependence. So the effects of both Raman and Rayleigh scattering will be most pronounced at shorter wavelengths, which is why um, I will be focusing on the blue end of the visible wavelength range in my study. Uh, but when we talk about cross-sections, the Raman cross-sections are typically about a few percent of really uh, cross-sections for the same molecule. So in, uh, as a source of opacity, Raman scattering is not as important. But as I will show in the next slide, it introduces these spectral, spectral features that really scattering does not, which is why I think it's interesting. Okay, so how do these spectral features come about? So let us assume that this is our incident stellar spectrum that has some uh, absorption lines. And now the reflected light will have the dominant component, which is produced by Rayleigh scattering. Mm -hmm. And because the intensity of the Rayleigh scattered light is directly proportional to the incident light at the same wavelength, this uh, spectrum will look basically like a copy <coughs> of the stellar spectrum. So it will have these lines at the same wavelength. The Raman scatter component, on the other hand, will have all these features shifted in wavelength space by the Raman shift. So now when we look at the total reflected light, which is just the sum of the Rayleigh and the Raman component, two things will happen. So first, this, these Rayleigh lines will get partially filled in by this Raman component. So they will no longer be as deep as they would be in the case of only Rayleigh scattering. And the second thing that happens is that we get these extra lines at the Raman shifted positions. So now when we look at the albedo spectrum, and I told you before, albedo is basically the ratio of the reflected light and the incident light, we again see two types of features. We get peaks in the albedo or enhancements of the albedo at the position of the original stellar lines because of this filling in effect. So there are more photons coming from these wavelengths than there would in the Rayleigh only case. And we get these dips in the albedo at the positions of Raman shifted lines, and we call these the Raman ghost lines. So these are the two types of features that we will be looking for in the albedo spectra of exoplanets. Okay, so here are the results of the radiative transfer calculation that I performed for a, a deep hydrogen helium atmosphere irradiated by the solar spectrum. And the radiative transfer includes the effects of Rayleigh and Raman scattering. So in a Rayleigh-only atmosphere, this albedo spectrum will basically be just like a flat line. So all these wiggles that you see are the result of Raman scattering. And you can see that at some features, especially corresponding to strong prominent lines in the stellar spectrum, such as this H and K uh, calcium lines, uh, al these albedo peaks can be quite strong. So th these are almost factor of two enhancements in albedo. However, the intensity of these lines will, is directly related to the depth of the atmosphere. And you can think of it as that if uh, the radiation can go through a deep column of atmosphere, uh, many more scattering events can occur and the effects of Raman scattering are more pronounced than in a shallow atmosphere where, uh, of a small column where radiation cannot uh, go very far and there are fewer scattering events. So here I compared the results uh, of, again, hydrogen-helium atmospheres of different depths. So here's the same as before, a deep, 100 bar deep atmosphere that shows very prominent uh, peaks. Um, in middle panel is the atmosphere that's uh, only one bar deep, so you can already see that these peaks are, uh, more su are slightly suppressed. And then in a very shallow atmosphere that's only 0.1 bar deep, you can hardly see any features. So basically what this plot tells us is that by measuring the intensity of these Raman uh, peaks, we have a way of saying how deep the atmosphere is or basically how deep the column is through which the 
uh, radiation can go through and whether the atmosphere is terminated either by the presence of a surface or a thick layer of clouds that doesn't allow radiation to go any uh, uh, further. Okay, so these were the albedo peaks. So the second type of features are ghost lines. So here in the simple picture, when we have just one absorption line that produces one peak, we get a whole series of Raman ghost lines. So if I zoom in, these are lines that are produced by different Raman transitions of the same molecule. And here, what they look like, what the structure of line looks like for hydrogen. Uh, for example, for another molecule like nitrogen, on the same scale, so this is the same wavelength scale, you, look that the, you see that the structure looks very different. The ghost lines are much more compressed. And the reason for that is that the offset of a ghost line from the original line is directly related to the uh, sep energy separations of the separation of the rotational level. So in a heavy molecule like nitrogen, rotational molecular levers are much more closer together. So all these Raman ghost lines will get piled up uh, much closer, and if we can measure these lines, we can say whether the molecule that's doing the scattering is a heavy molecule like N2 or a light molecule like H2. And I'll remind you, these are usually spectrally inactive molecules, so this might be uh, one of the most direct ways to actually spectroscopically determine their presence. Uh, another piece of information that's contained in the ghost line is the temperature. So based on the relative intensity of different ghost lines, we can say something about the initial population of molecular levels, or in other words, say something about the temperature. So here I compare uh, the ghost lines for cold, 100 Kelvin uh, cold uh, atmosphere in black, and a 1500 Kelvin atmosphere uh, in orange. And you can see that in a hotter atmosphere, many more rotational levels are initially populated, producing many more lines. I have just one more slide that talks about the actually observing these lines. So in the solar system bodies, for example, especially, uh, so these are actual data, so these are measured albedo spectra for solar system bodies. Uh, in uh, Neptune and Uranus, you see these lovely features that are uh, uh, Raman scattering features. In atmospheres like Jupiter and uh, Saturn, they're less pronounced because of the presence of high altitude haze. Uh, and in Titan, we, can bear, we don't see them at all. So already in our solar system, we see how we can use the prominence of these uh, features to say something about the diversity of atmospheres. Unfortunately, for exoplanets at the moment, this is the state-of-the-art albedo spectrum. So you see that the spectral resolution is not, um, is not there yet to say anything about the presence of Raman uh, features. But hopefully, with the next generation of instruments, so ground-based telescopes like the GMT or space-based coronagraphs like the concept missions that have been proposed, Habex and Louvoir, we might be able to say something about the presence of Raman features and use them to probe the atmospheres of exoplanets. So because I'm out of time, I'll just leave up my summary slide and thank you for your attention. It's uh, HST, yes. HST, so is it really going to improve the, you know, the ground based? So, I think ground based uh, have a shot at this using a different technique. So, you, so the, uh, ha the Hubble data were, was obtained with uh, using secondary eclipse observations, but a ground based data, uh, ground based telescopes, I think, have a shot at observing this using that high spectral resolution. Um, uh, observations that people have used to study in the infrared, but not so much in these wavelengths. Um, so yeah, I think maybe with being clever and using different observing strategy, maybe it's possible to do it with ground-based observations. That would also depend on the composition and the, and the consequent absorption of all the other components of the atmosphere, including those that are unknown. So I was wondering if you tried this out 
So I haven't, yeah, I haven't tried looking at, so I did separate studies for H2 atmosphere and an N2 atmosphere, but I haven't tried mixing them up to, and see how, what fraction of lines come from having different ratios of these two atmospheres, of these two uh, molecules. Uh, so I haven't done the study, but I think it, it could be modeled. Uh, but uh, I haven't tried doing terrestrial planets, but I should say that Raman scattering has been observed in Earth's atmosphere, and it has been used for uh, various uh, studies, detailed studies of the Earth's atmosphere, including by people here at the CSA. Any other questions? This is laser, this is a laser. <laughs> You're running? <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to tell you about an experiment that we hope to be doing over the next uh, five to ten years or so with a new telescope that we are building in Chile, CCAT uh, Prime. And it's going to be intensity mapping uh, back to the epoch of reionization in the C plus line. So, okay. Ah, it's the other direction. Great. Um, so just kind of a quick introduction in case you're not familiar with the telescope. Um, so essentially this telescope you're trying to build is a six meter submillimeter telescope in Chile on Cerro Chatna Tor, which is a mountain um, of 12,600 meters. And um, this telescope is going to be operating at wavelengths between 200 micro and about three millimeters, so submillimeter to millimeter wavelengths. And the unique thing about this telescope is even though it's only six meters, is um, that has about a 50 square degrees field of view, it's an enormous field of view to the wide scale mapping in the submillimeter. And we hope to have first light in 2021 and construction is going to start soon. So the long term goal with this uh, telescope is to essentially do mapping of uh, CMB polarization more than order of magnitude faster than is possible at the moment. But since there will not be enough detectors available um, in the world at first light, essentially there are several services we're going to do in the first few years with it. Uh, that are listed here, going all the way from galactic star formation to cosmology. But the one that I'm going to concentrate on in this talk is essentially um, the intensity mapping in the epoch of reionization. So just to orient yourselves, essentially the epoch of reionization is this phase in the history of the universe when the universe transitions from being largely neutral uh, to largely ionized like it is at present day. And this epoch here will be in a few hundred million years after the Big Bang to about a billion years after the Big Bang. And essentially, we think that this happens due to the formation of the first stars and galaxies, which then produce ionizing UV photons that then causes ionization of an intergalactic medium. And of course, we know of the existence of some very bright galaxies between redstone of 8 to 11 or so a two day already, um, and that are candidates for source of reionization. However, these are still relatively bright galaxies. And one of the main problems in doing this systematically is that um, Essentially, the UV luminosity function at these redshifts is very steep, and this implies that essentially most of the sources actually cause ionization are very faint and therefore very difficult to detect individually. So the idea that we have for this experiment is to essentially not go after individual sources, but to map the integrated and aggregate intensity from these faint sources on larger scales uh, through intensity mapping. So that's the idea of the experiment. And uh, the reason why this is interesting is what's shown in this slide here, which is that um, reionization is not really a phase transition, but it's something that's stretched out in time and therefore stretched out in redshift. In particular, what we know from simulations is um, that uh, reionization is expected to happen first in regions of higher density um, because essentially there you have more ionizing photons. Then uh, these, once these regions are ionized, the photons leak uh, into under dense regions and therefore voids are going to be reionized. And uh, in the end, essentially, uh, regions of average density are going to be ionized. So there's a strong dependence on the local density on when reionization takes place. And therefore, what we ideally want to do is um, to essentially map out um, the signal in three dimensions. 
And since we know that essentially it seems to be galaxy clustering that's driving this evolution, because in more clustered regions, reionization happens at earlier times. So essentially, we want to map this signal spatially and as a function of redshift to essentially learn about the structure of reionization. And um, the way that we plan to do this is uh, with the 158 micron line of C+, which is a trace of star formation. And specifically, what we want to measure is the clustering signal that we get from reionization galaxies in this line, specifically in redshifts of 6 to 8, but essentially spend a larger region in redshift to essentially get better calibration um, of the signal because the signal is stronger, stronger at lower redshifts. So essentially, we want to understand the topology and time scale of reionization and essentially when galaxies first formed and how they impacted reionization. And then finally, by measuring the signal from these star-forming galaxies, we will be able to measure whether or not there are enough photons out there to cause reionization from these galaxies or if you need an additional contribution. And of course, this is something that's very uh, related to an experiment that's being done in the radio in, um, by the SKA and currently by pathfinders like HERA, which is looking at the signal in the H121 centimeter line, looking at the disappearance of the neutral gas as a function of redshift. But by doing this measurement, we hope that we get some complementary information out earlier. And we specifically um, picked the C plus line first because it's relatively easy to detect. It's being redshifted to about a millimeter wavelength, which is easy to observe from the ground at reionization redshifts. The signal itself is much stronger than the 21 centimeter signal, and this is why we can do it with a small telescope. And also the foregrounds are much simpler at this wavelength than at the low radio, a long radio where we observe 21 centimeter emission at these redshifts. Um, compared to like OUV lines like Lyman Alpha, it has the advantage that actually the signal is not being absorbed by the intergalactic medium that gets increasingly neutral in this epoch, making lines like Lyman Alpha much harder to observe. And then there's also advantages to other diagnostics like, for example, CO, um, which has a much stronger dependence on metallicity. So the idea is essentially that we take slices as a function of redshift in this epoch of reionization, and at each redshift we essentially get a map that shows us the distribution of the C plus signal. Then, of course, the brightest uh, spots within this these resolution elements are the galaxies that we can, in principle, individually study with ALMA in the same line, and this is what's being done at the moment, but essentially there's only a small fraction of the signal that's actually there. We're trying to map out all of it. Um, in terms of predictions, there have been several simulations run, and here's just kind of an example. So what we expect essentially is here, this is just the intensity of C plus and Jensky burst radio on this axis as a function of redshift. So this here is the dependence of the signal, and this here is the redshift range that we can cover, and this here is the kind of core area of interest in the epoch of reionization. And essentially this scale here shows you why essentially we go to a lower redshift to try to essentially get a calibration, because it should be much easier to get a detection of the clustering signal at this lower redshift, and therefore calibrate the harder part of it at the higher redshifts. Okay, so um, what do we have in terms of predictions of the actual signals? So again, what we're after is a clustering signal, and therefore you think about this in terms of um, a power spectrum to essentially see how much signal there is on different scales. And that's what's shown here, essentially just the power spectrum on different scales. And the different lines here are different predictions that are out there um, that have been done in the past few years. And specifically what we're after here is these scales here, where essentially the signal is dominated by clustering on smaller scales, dominated by the short nose from individual sources. But then essentially we expect this kind of plateauing here at certain scales that are relevant to the clustering of sources. Now the first thing that you can see from these colored lines is that there's a huge discrepancy between different models. So it's about a factor of 30 scatter or so between different predictions. And this really is why we need to make a measurement, because we want to be able to tell, about, uh, tell a part between these different predictions here. And for a reference, essentially this dash dotted blue line here is the sensitivity that we will reach with the survey that we uh, will do with CCAT prime. So essentially we can distinguish between all of these different models and we are able to learn uh, what's correct. So essentially the C plus is what we want to measure and this is the prime measurement that we are trying to make. Um, there's of course other things, things that we can do with this um, based on other things that are being done, in particular the 21 centimeter measurements, because there's an enormous power in actually taking the C plus signal and then cross correlating it with the H1 measurements that are being done by SKA um, a few years later and also by the pathfinders. Because it turns out that essentially what we're looking at, of course, is the signal that we get from star forming galaxies, emission lines from star forming galaxies, and these are the sources of reionization, which means that we are looking at galaxies that sit in the areas where the H1 disappears due to the fact that these galaxies are doing the reionization. And this means that on large scales there's an anti-correlation expected between the H1 signal and the C plus signal. And this anti-correlation is essentially something we can measure to essentially calibrate the H1 measurements, which are difficult to do, but then also to do some science with it. 
Because it turns out that essentially this uh, cross correlation is an anti correlation on large scales, but on small scales it turns out a positive correlation um, because of the metro density auto correlation on small scales. And the turnover when the signal turns from negative to positive essentially tells us about the size scales uh, of the bubbles at these early times uh, of ionized gas. So essentially you can do a cross correlation, and essentially by looking at the turnover point, you can determine the size of the bubbles at reionization. Okay, so this is what I had. I'm just going to leave out my summary because I'm probably about uh, out of time. So this is something that we're excited about to be doing in the next years. Um, sorry? One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Wow, that's fast. So, so essentially we're trying to do this measurement in the very early universe in this epoch of reionization, but it's hard to essentially have other tracers out there to really characterize the overall properties of galaxies beyond individual sources uh, to essentially understand how reionization happens and when reionization happens under which conditions using a line that essentially traces the ultraviolet field in galaxies and therefore is a tracer indirectly of the photons that come out of galaxies that cause reionization. And by doing this measurements, we understand hopefully a lot more about how organization happens in the early universe. All right. Before I open it to questions, I would like to make a historical comment. All right. I was very amused that Dominic said, apologize for having only a six meter diameter mirror. <laughs> Um, so it's essentially a lot of differences in the input. For example, there's this one paper here, this uh, Sarah paper, let's see if I can get the pointer to work, which essentially has this prediction and this prediction, which you can see of the same shape, but a huge offset um, um, in the actual strength of the signal. And this is essentially putting the same model, but one's trying to do the measurements based on Planck data and one's based on Herschel data. And you can see that um, based on using this information, they already get this huge range and scatter. And then you can see that there, I mean, many of them have the overall shape that you expect with the shot noise and then the plateauing in terms of the clustering, but not all of them have that. So it's essentially a lot of it is kind of in what you use as the input to try to make these predictions. Some of it, of course, the astrophysics of how strong the line actually is in these galaxies, how you essentially go from the halos that you have in your simulations and point on the actual line flux. There's some uncertainty in that um, and how it scales with different properties, like, for example, metallicity. Uh, but some of it is, is data-based, and essentially, depending on which data set you take, you already get this difference in predictions based on what makes up your signal. So it's, it's a lot of factors that go into this uncertainty, so it's a very hard measurement to make because it entails a lot of astrophysics, but then also so the constraint that you can still So it's uncertain in the data that you use to make predictions or the simulations that you use to make predictions and how you essentially paint on the line flux from what you have, which is either continuum data or dark matter simulations, right, where you essentially try to determine flux of galaxies that sit in those halos, which has several steps to go through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I talked about the telescope, but what is the actual instrument? Uh, Let's see if I actually have a slide that's still in here. I think I don't in this particular one. Because I didn't have that. Yeah, okay, so I have this slide that I can show. So essentially, the instrument that we're using will be a bolometer camera that has four colors, so essentially 760, 850 micron, 1.1 millimeter, and 1.3 millimeter. So essentially, you have quadrochroic pixels, which have two polarizations, so essentially eight detectors that cover this entire wavelength range. And essentially, in front of this camera, we put a Fabio Poro, which then essentially scans through the frequency range continuously uh, to get the spectrum out, spectral information out. So essentially, essentially, have this kind of scanning through the different atmospheric windows that's going on as a function of time, and then we also essentially scan on the sky. So that's how we get the three-dimensional information out. Um, so how many total barometers are involved? Uh, so this, um, let's see, it's a few thousand. It's either 4,000 or 8,000 was the assumption. So it's, you need several thousand to essentially make this measurement in a reasonable amount of time, which in this case is a few thousand hours. Um, so it's at a millimeter, that's... That's not a crazy amount, but it's not an insignificant amount either. So do you get to plug into the ALMA OSF infrastructure, or do you need your own beds and cafeterias? And uh, that's a fair question. So there's, there will hopefully be some shared infrastructure, and for example, also with the APEX telescope, which I have the base camp. 
um, down there. So there'll be some shared infrastructure, there might be some shared positions like engineers between different projects. With Alma, it's more difficult because there's such a huge enterprise, but with some of the single dishes, it's a bit easier. And then there's also the idea that hopefully we can plug into the Alma power grid eventually, so we just run a cable down the mountain to the Alma side to plug in. But that's something that we're still trying to figure out with, um, with the observatory itself. But for now, since we plan to have generators on site, and then you need to run a fuel truck up the mountain, which will be a challenge in itself, but well, that's a backup plan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So today I'm going to talk uh, about a different topic uh, from what I discussed in the colloquium that's on um, title disruption events. Um, and so this is a project with Sasha Chikosko and Nick Stone, who are both grad students here, I think, in the past, and also Matthew Lischka and Brian Metzger. And it's on how uh, title disruption events can tell us about uh, disk formation, which I think is really um, something very unique about title disruption events. They can tell us how disks form in situ, uh, which I think is kind of difficult to do um, from other astrophysical uh, objects. So just to summarize what I'm going to talk about, I just want to go over the basics of a TDE, Tidal Disruption Event. I think people are probably pretty familiar with this topic. Um, it's been, been a pretty hot topic lately. I just want to go over the basics, uh, talk about simulating Tidal Disruption Events, what people have done in the past, why it's uh, particularly challenging, and then I'll talk about what we've done um, in simulating these, this disk formation um, in TDEs. Okay, so the basics of a Tidal Disruption Event, what is this? Um, it's basically what happens if a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Um, so if this happens, the tidal force of the black hole can become very large. Um, so that introduces this quadrupolar distortion to the star. Um, and if the star comes very close, those tidal um, stretching, that tidal stretching can actually overcome the force of self-gravity um, on the star. And so since self-gravity is ultimately the thing holding the star together, um, if those tidal forces surmount the force of self-gravity, you tear the star apart. Um, what you tend to do is you, is you kind of transform what was previously a nice spherical star into this long, thin debris stream. Um, so this is just a little picture that shows this nice spherical star. And you transform it into this long, thin spaghetti-like strand um, of tidally disrupted debris. So what's interesting about this, I mean, this is already pretty interesting, but there's also another interesting aspect, which is that in addition to the tidal force that the black hole exerts, there's also a tidal potential. Um, and what that means is that there's a range of binding energies um, that are kind of imparted to this stream. Um, and half of this stream, the half that's closer to the supermassive black hole, so assume the supermassive black hole is down there somewhere, this half of the stream remains bound to the supermassive black hole, which means that eventually it's going to return to approximately the point of disruption. And when it does so, uh, general relativistic precession, so this apsidal precession predicted by Einstein like a century ago, um, causes this incoming debris stream to swing through an additional angle, which ends up being about 10 degrees if you have a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole and a solar-like star. And what that means is that you generate an incoming and outgoing debris stream that eventually self-intersect at some fairly large radius. Um, so this is a little little cartoon that just shows this. You have the same stream, the same one here. This is just at a much later time. You've stretched this thing out by factors of a thousand. Um, and this thing is now going in, coming back out. It's getting swung through this angle, and it's hitting itself. And so at that point, um, you cause this material to shock. You can dissipate energy and momentum, and you can form a disk around the, the supermassive black hole. And that's where we actually start to see these things. Um, material heats up, emits a bunch of light, and you ignite this period of quasar-like activity in the center of the galaxy that was otherwise quiescent. Um, there's also been some work on, on looking at how much energy you can get out of this shock um, in the first place. Maybe that contributes to the light. 
But nonetheless, the disk formation um, and the disk itself is, is nonetheless going to be a, a dominant source of, of, um, of emission in these events. Okay, so ideally, um, you'd like to simulate something like this because it's, it's a combination of a lot of physics that takes place, hydrodynamics, self-gravity. Um, and this turns out to be kind of difficult because the range of spatial and temporal scales becomes uh, very large very quickly. Um, so you go from something that's a star in size that you ideally would like to resolve um, to something, so you push that to the tidal radius, that's a hundred times the stellar radius, and then you stretch the star into something that's a thousand times the tidal radius in size, and so you go from a scale of one stellar radius to a factor of a million times that. Um, and so it, it just ends up being a lot of uh, space that you need that you need to care about. Um, and so the way, um, particularly, I think an easier way to do this is to use an SPH method um, or a Lagrangian approach um, that basically doesn't care about the fact that you have a bunch of empty space um, in which this debris stream and the star are evolving. Um, you can kind of focus all of your um, computational resources on the fluid elements themselves. Um, but even this uh, turns out to be difficult, especially to resolve this incoming debris stream. Uh, because as this thing is evolving, um, it's getting stretched continuously. Um, and so the number of particles that you have in the stream um, becomes very small, right? Ideally, you'd want to have like at least um, 10 particles, 10 smoothing lengths across the stream. And it just gets very difficult to do that numerically um, with a reasonable number of particles. And so what happens if you, is if you, try to, if you try to simulate the disk formation from just doing uh, standard simulation with SPH, um, what you find is that these particles come back uh, to pericenter, where they would, um, in the real universe, would just nicely pass through and go back out and self-intersect. Because you have so few particles, uh, the smoothing lengths become very large, and you basically generate these spurious pressure gradients that cause particles to just fly all over the place, uh, none of which is physical. Um, and so, so doing this, so simulating um, tidal disruption events, especially this disk formation phase, um, which would be very interesting for trying to understand where ultimately a lot of the light is coming from, um, is very difficult. And so the ways that you can overcome this, um, one is you can use billions of particles. Um, so that's very expensive, at least for me at the moment. Um, the code that I've been using to do um, some simulations of this in the past is Phantom. It's currently not MPI enabled. Um, so it would take me like years to do this if I wanted to do um, a billion particles. Um, you can also do um, a number of what uh, James has referred to as cheats. Um, so you can use a smaller black hole. Um, you can use bound stars. You can use different stars, smaller stars. And all of these kind of overcome some of these numerical difficulties that you're faced with if you want to do the real problem, um, which I would define as a solar-like star disrupted by a million solar mass black hole. Um, but some of these kind of miss the physics of the real problem. And so if you do, um, say, like a 1,000 uh, solar mass black hole, um, this general relativistic uh, precession angle, apsidal precession angle, just becomes minuscule, right? There's no angle by which the material is swung through. Um, and in that case, the dominant form of dissipation um, is actually a recompression shock that you get at pericenter. Um, and so there still is dissipation, but it's, it's not through like the, the standard um, means by which Martin Rees kind of thought of uh, back in his famous 1988 paper. Um, and so one alternative, um, in addition to using these standard sheets that people have done in the past, um, is to use kind of a hybrid approach. And so to start with um, SPH to do the initial disruption, um, get to the point where the stream is starting to return, and then take all the fluid quantities and map them over into a grid where you can do a higher resolution um, zoomed in sort of simulation of the disk formation. And so Oleg Shadovsky did this um, with Chef and Roswag's uh, GRSPH code um, alongside his grid code Coral. Um, but again, they kind of did um, a few minor cheats, right? They used a smaller mass black hole, a smaller star, an eccentric orbit. And all of these things kind of, um, again, just sort of facilitate uh, the numerical woes that accompany this. Um, and so what we did um, with Sasha was we tried to do this uh, with as realistic a set of parameters as we could, ultimately to see how this works um, in something that's closer to the real problem. And so we did a solar-like progenitor, um, which we model as a polytrope. You can change that if you want. That's not too difficult. Um, we did a million solar mass black hole. Um, and the way that I would say that we cheated the most is we, we chose a particularly small pericenter distance. So the star, instead of coming within the tidal radius, comes within a factor of seven smaller than that. And what that means is that when the stream returns, the general relativistic precession angle is quite large, and so it self-intersects at a small radius. And the self-intersection is also quite strong, and so it dissipates a lot of energy. So we did the initial disruption in Phantom, 
Uh, we did this with um, 100 million particles. That was sort of the max I could do. Um, it's probably important to use a lot of particles for this because that initial disruption um, compresses the star by quite a large degree, and so you want to be able to resolve that. Um, and then we mapped all of this over to um, HARM, or Sasha's version hammer, um, to follow the, the rest of the disk formation. Um, and then we use the Kerr metric um, in an attempt to really try to see how this works. So this is a movie. Um, so I have a zoom in here um, on the uh, regions immediately surrounding the black hole. On the right is a zoom out showing the stream coming in. The stream is kind of puffed up in this case because it's been shocked as it went through pericenter, the initial stellar passage. Um, so if I play this, what you see is that this stream comes in, comes back out, and indeed you see this self-intersection as it passes through this, this general, relativistic periapsin, uh, general relativistic angle that it gets swung through. And so interestingly, you see that it kind of it self-intersects and it almost like blasts stuff out. Um, and you almost get this like periodic uh, uh, kind of blowing out of material and then reforming of the, of the debris stream um, that continues in this, pass in this fashion for a while. Um, so of course, Sasha thinks about GR all the time, and so everything is in units of RG over C. So 50,000 RG over C is about three days um, following the, the initial, or actually starting from the, the point that I showed, which is like about uh, three weeks or so after the initial disruption of the star. Um, and so you can see by the end of this, you get this like highly inflated, um, puffed up torus type thing, uh, which doesn't really resemble the usual thin disk. Okay, I'd like to show you more plots. I don't have time. Um, and also, Matthew, I asked him to send me plots. He said he was on vacation in Greece and didn't have time for it. <laughs> um, so I'll just end there and uh, put up my conclusions and take any questions. Thanks. Yeah, Dan. Have moving mesh codes been used to try to tackle this problem? I think so. I think um, uh, Tsvi Peran um, and some of his either grad students or collaborators had developed a uh, moving mesh code to try to do this. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, they found, yeah, so they, he talked about this a little bit at a meeting a few weeks ago. And it's, yeah. Yeah, James. Any late predictions yet? No. <laughs> yeah, we. We, um, this project has been going on for like a while. Um, I think Matthew and Sasha are both really busy. Um, Sasha just started this job at, at uh, Chicago and I, yeah, it's been kind of put on the back burner. I'm really interested to see uh, what sort of things are going to come out of this because obviously, yeah, I mean this gigantic inflated disc thing uh, that you get at the end of it, if I can fast forward all the way there. I mean, I think, you know, doing the actual ray tracing and, and not in situ, like not during the simulation. We haven't included, we didn't include radiation in it, but you could definitely post-process it and see what sort of, what sort of stuff you get out of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just that the self-intersection. So, the if you get closer to the black hole, the angle through which you swing um, from the general relativistic apsidal precession angle um, is much larger. And so you self-intersect really close to the black hole. And so for the grid code, if you used it at the tidal radius, the self-intersection radius would be like 1,000 or more RG. Um, and that just gets to be um, intensive on the, on the domain that you want to capture. So. What's the, what's the time? Yeah, so the typical duration um, before you get, uh, before the viscous time scale becomes important is like uh, months to years, depends on the mass of the supermassive black hole. Um, but for a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, duration is like, yeah, months to years. So, yeah, humanly observable. <laughs> Not 10 years. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any uh, focus so. of extending the simulation to see what happens to this inflated disk or whatever resemble a thin disk ultimately? Or yeah. Um, so these simulations right now, 
are taking a very long time. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, so they've tried, they've done some really amazing things uh, with GPU, with GPUs. Um, I think right now the best we can probably do is extend it. So that movie that I showed went out to about three days. The best we could probably do is to go out to like, hopefully like two weeks. Um, and at that point, the accretion rate should actually drop. And so maybe you could see, see it start to try to resemble something that would look closer to a thin disk, but yeah. So what we, um, not, so not the initial conditions, um, but what we tried to look at, yeah, you can set this, set this up. Um, what we tried to, what we plan to look at actually is how the black hole um, rotation and the angle, the offset of the rotation of the black hole and the plane of the incoming star um, affect the circularization process and the formation of the disk. Um, that's sort of the plan, that's what we want to, that's what we hope to do. So, yeah, so I guess that's the initial conditions, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so it's uh, great to be back here uh, at the CFA. Um, today I will tell you about uh, the role of galaxy mergers and uh, spin of the dark matter halo in shaping galaxy morphology, at least according to the illustrious simulation. Um, these are some of my uh, collaborators uh, on this project. So, um, okay, so I'll give a brief introduction on, on the topic, and then uh, you know I will explain how, how we measure galaxy morphology in the simulation, and then I will explore some of the uh, uh, factors that can shape uh, galaxy morphology. So, um, let's see. Oops, where is the mouse? There we go. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so, so this movie shows a, a very classic uh, uh, mer merger simulation of, uh, you know, of uh, two of these galaxies uh, colliding. Um, and every once in a while, it, the, the, uh, the simulation is compared to a real galaxy image uh, obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. So uh, yeah, I like this because it's a very uh, a direct, uh, very striking demonstration of uh, the fact that uh, galaxy mergers do explain some uh, observed features of, of galaxies. So, um, so of course, with a large uh, co hydrodynamic cosmological simulation like Illustrious, you can have thousands of mergers such as this. So it's great to to explore this in a, from a statistical um, perspective. So, um, okay, so, yeah, so yeah, galaxy mergers are important in, in, in the galaxy formation model. Um, um, in particular, uh, very important for this topic is the, the so-called uh, merger hypothesis. Uh, this was originally proposed by Alar Tumor. Um, and basically it proposes that uh, elliptical galaxies could be the result of uh, a merger between uh, two disk galaxies. Um, and this idea started to gain, um, uh, become accepted uh, as, as people realized uh, the, about the uh, hierarchical uh, uh, formation of structure in the universe. Um, of course, after decades of uh, computer simulations of galaxy mergers, we know that the situation is not so simple. Uh, in this particular example, um, this is a simulation of a merger between two uh, pure disk galaxies or bulge disk galaxies. And uh, what it was found is that the remnant, even though the remnant has some similarities with actual elliptics, the core was not uh, concentrated enough to be uh, comparable to real galaxies. So, uh, in fact, now we know that the, uh, the outcome of a merger depends on, uh, well, mainly, uh, mainly on four things, uh, which is the, the masses, gas fractions, uh, morphologies of the two uh, galaxies, and also on the orbit of the merger. So, of course, if you're just uh, running um, you know, uh, idealized merger simulations, you would need like hundreds of, of, of different runs with uh, different angles and everything to, to have a representative uh, 
sample of the, of, of the full population. So the idea tool is a cosmological simulation so that you, you naturally sample the, the full range of, of uh, orbits. Uh, so, so that's what I did with uh, illustrators. Okay, so this is, uh, so the illustrator, the illustrator simulation is about uh, 100 megaparsec uh, on each side. Um, it uh, produces uh, tens of thousands of uh, galaxies with masses about, about 10 to the 9 solar masses. And the model was reasonably uh, successful in, in uh, reproducing some observables. This is a, a nice image uh, made by uh, uh, Annalisa Lippich, who was a postdoc here. Um, here, uh, uh, she's comparing um, images of interacting galaxies from the Luster simulation here at the bottom and comparing them with images of real uh, HST uh, uh, interacting pairs. <coughs> so, okay. So uh, the way we measure galaxy morphology, at least in this project, is um, something that's very simple to do in a simulation, which is to measure the fraction of kinetic energy in invested in order uh, rotation. Uh, this is called the kappa parameter, and it's a measure of kinematic uh, morphology. So, um, um, yeah, so this is showing examples of objects with uh, high uh, values of kappa, which are disks, and uh, examples with uh, lower values of kappa, which are spherics. Um, here I say, uh, um, well, this, this disk, in, in principle, a uh, perfect disk should have kappa of one, but in the lottery, the disks are a bit thick, so uh, kappa of 0.6 is, is, is the largest we, we, we achieved. Um, now I will just uh, briefly uh, ad advertise uh, something that I did more recently, which is called to calculate uh, other types of galaxy morphology. Um, yeah, you, can, you, know, you can ask me if, if you're interested, but... Uh, this is not what I used uh, for this project, so just a bit of an advertisement. Um, okay, so now, uh, okay, so now that we measure galaxy morphologies, uh, you can ask so what determines galaxy morphology. So there is a famous paper by, uh, well, a well-known paper by Laura Salis, where they found that the galaxy morphology measured by this kappa parameter does not correlate at all with uh, the fraction of, of uh, stellar mass accreted from mergers which is this if I created, or with the spin of the dark matter hail, which is this lambda parameter. So they found no correlation. However, they only studied galaxies uh, of Milky Way size galaxies. So, um, so now with the lotters, we can, we can explore a, a wider uh, mass range. So, uh, so first of all, uh, I measured the uh, exito stellar mass fraction in, in lotters. So, so that's the, the fraction of a galaxy's uh, stellar mass that uh, is contributed from, by a uh, uh, with, with other galaxies. Uh, we find that it's a very strong function of, uh, of stellar mass. So that very massive for very massive galaxies, more than half of their mass was accreted through, through mergers. Um, well, uh, I also showed here that the, this uh, ex situ fraction is a good proxy for other uh, merger uh, uh, diagnostics, such as uh, merger gas fractions, so that dry uh, galaxies with high uh, ex situ fractions also have um, ha are more likely to, ha to have had uh, dry mergers, also recent mergers, and uh, major mergers as opposed to minor mergers. So basically, essentially, we're encapsulating uh, the importance of merging history in this, in this quantity called the ex situ stellar mass fraction. So, okay, so what do we find? So if we compare the ex situ stellar mass fraction shown here in the x-axis with the kappa uh, morphology, with, um, at the, in different mass ranges. So these are uh, small galaxies, medium-sized galaxies, uh, which includes the Milky Way, and then massive galaxies. We find that in the most massive uh, mass, in there, there, I mean, there is a clear correlation between uh, the morphology and the ex situ stellar mass fraction. Um, however, the situation is less clear at, at lower masses, and, and, and the lower mass mean there is definitely uh, nothing. Um, another way to look at this is to look at the uh, average gas fraction of all the mergers that the galaxy has ever had. And here there is also a correlation uh, so that uh, dry mergers uh, lead to the formation of uh, elliptical galaxies. Um, but, but again, at the low mass end, there is, there is nothing. So, uh, so I asked, okay, so, so what, what correlates with galaxy morphology at the low mass end? So I looked for uh, at almost basically every quantity I could think of in, in illustrious. And the only thing I found that correlates uh, somewhat here is the uh, spin of the dark matter halo. Um, well, we measure it. Uh, well, this is the definition. It's, it's essentially the fraction of, of, uh, of, of a halo's uh, velocity support that comes from rotation. And it's um, the peak here in the distribution is around uh, 3% or 3 or 
So that's the lambda parameter. And here we find sort of the opposite behavior. So in the lower mass beam, there is some uh, cor correlation. Um, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not uh, like too, too striking, but I mean, there is something here. It shows up, shows up a bit better in logarithmic uh, scale. And however, this, this effect is erased at higher masses, presumably due to the effect of mergers. Uh, here I try, to, I try to summarize everything into a single plot. Um, so here uh, the, x, the y axis is the ex situ fraction, x axis is the uh, spin of the dark matter halo. The color is the morphology, so that red is more uh, spheroidal. And each panel corresponds to a different mass beam. So, uh, so here if, if the color gradient is uh, horizontal, as in the lower mass, this means that the uh, uh, halo spin is the important quantity. And on the other hand, at the higher, uh, in the high mass beam, um, the color gradient is somewhat vertical, which means that uh, it's actually mergers and not halo spin, but what has a, an important effect. So um, essentially, uh, these findings are consistent with, um, I guess, a revised version of the merger hypothesis, as proposed by uh, Thorsten Nab and others, uh, who, who say that dry mergers are important for ellipticals. So, so not any mergers, just but repeated dry mergers, uh, what form uh, ellipticals. And at the same time, we also have uh, major mergers with res which result in a, in a spiral galaxy. And this has also been seen in, in idealized simulations of gas-rich mergers. So essentially, galaxy mergers can lead to both um, you know, ellipticals and, and, and uh, spirals, depending on, you know, on the mass range and the gas fractions and, and other things. So, uh, okay, so I think I finished on time. Um, so uh, these are my conclusions. We find that the ex situ stellar mass fraction is a strong... Uh, Function of mass, ranging from like 10% for pinky wheel -like, uh, like galaxies to like 10 to the 12, to uh, over 80% for the most massive galaxies in the simulations. And uh, yes, and uh, yeah, we found this. So for Milky Way sized galaxies, uh, galaxy morphology is, is weakly correlated with merging history of halo spin when these factors are considered individually. Uh, but uh, but the, the, they are correlated with a combination, of, as you can see, by a sort of diagonal gradient here. And, uh, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, in massive galaxies, mergers are, are pretty important. So, thanks. Okay, thanks. <laughs>